the future of living in space. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're going to answer the question, what will living in space be like? We're going to talk with Paul Albert LeBron, product manager at Kepler Communications, who's helping bring the internet to space. As our species begins to move beyond our planetary cradle, what will life be like for the first generations of humans living in space? Now, somewhere around 2 million years ago, our earliest human ancestors evolved in the wilds of southern and eastern Africa. Soon, the first tentative steps outside the African continent may have been made by a handful of Homo erectus travelers exploring the distant horizon. It was not until somewhere between 60,000 and 80,000 years ago that prehistoric humans first made their way in mass to another continent, Asia. About 45,000 years before our time, our distant predecessors made it to Australia and Indonesia. Roughly 5,000 years after that, humans first entered Europe. As ancient migrations began to fill the New World 150 centuries before our time, we became a global species for the first time in history. Today, we stand at the precipice of another cultural revolution as great as the one that first led our distant ancestors out of Africa. We are currently engaged in bringing about the next great leap forward for the human race, journeying to the stars. Now, leaving our planetary cradle will not be easy, and it will not come without risk, financial and human costs, and tragic heartbreaks. But embracing our destiny, growing into an interplanetary species, promises rewards beyond the dreams of avarice. One of the great challenges as we move out into space will be developing the resources needed to survive the harsh environments found outside the confines of our cozy planet. Water and oxygen supplies are essential to survival on other worlds. Fortunately, oxygen can easily be extracted from water. As we explore the moon and Mars, we find this material is far more common than once believed making human settlements on these worlds somewhat easier than once thought. The soil of Mars and the moon might be processed into housing using 3D printers controlled by artificial intelligence. NASA already has AI guiding robots aboard the International Space Station and they'll journey with us to the moon. Communications are one of the central tenets of what it means to be human. People around the globe today speak a total of about 7,000 languages or so. Graphic communication systems have evolved from simple pictograms to computer graphics. The development of the internet and the World Wide Web is now revolutionizing the way we communicate here on Earth. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. 
For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. As we move out into the cosmos, the internet will evolve and change as space-borne communications and interactions between distant colonies become the norm. We talk with Paul Albert LeBron, product manager at Kepler Communications, about bringing the internet to space. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Paul Albert LeBron. He is product manager at Kepler Communications, and they're on a mission to build internet in space. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so just give us a brief overview. What is Kepler Communications, and what is it that you're hoping to do? Sure. Um, yeah, Kepler was founded in, in 2015 by a group of, uh, of four guys who originally went to the University of Toronto. That's where they met. Um, and I think during their time uh, as students at U of T, they, they kind of got familiar with the space industry through projects, through extracurricular projects. Um, and one thing that they noticed was that the space sector, um, specifically access to space, was becoming kind of redefined or was fundamentally being redefined. Um, and I think one of the things they noticed pretty rapidly was that with this huge influx in sort of startups and simply commercial entities kind of taking part in this new space race, there was uh, kind of a fundamental miss when it came to a telecommunication infrastructure in space. So all these kind of assets were orbiting around the Earth all communicating to Earth via their own system, via their own telecommunication system, but it wasn't all interconnected. Um, and that's kind of how Kepler was founded. It was founded on this mission that, that you know, we had to build the internet in outer space. So um, very similar to how, you know, on Earth, um, we enjoy an incredible wealth of digital economy. Um, and all that is driven by a telecommunication infrastructure. Well, Kepler wants to essentially pave that same way, but in, in space. Um, once, you know, that mission was birthed, Kepler kind of uh, launched a service and uh, within five years, we became kind of the largest satellite operator in Canada, uh, operating the largest constellation of satellites. Um, so the service related to really providing Internet access in outer space is called Ether. It's what we're calling Ether. Um, and uh, that's kind of the product that I'm, I'm currently overseeing as well. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically in a nutshell who Kepler is and what Ether is, which is providing the internet uh, to outer space. That's cool. So, what would you mean we're up and going now in a couple of spacecraft and we are up in orbit, let's say low Earth orbit? What 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 would what would Ether? What kind of internet would Ether be providing? Just I mean, could, how many cat pics per hour could I download? <laughs> That's an excellent uh, question. Um, right, so the way that we see it is, you know, if you think about the experience of getting onto a network right now, like if, if you had your cell phone and I told you, you know, go, go get on the network and start using 4G or 5G, you'd start with going to get a terminal, right? Like you'd get a, a SIM card that you put into your phone, you'd turn on your phone and your phone would kind of automatically connect to the network. And those that network is essentially a bunch of, cell towers, right, uh, that are distributed uh, around the earth. Um, so we're thinking of it very similarly, right? Like we give you a, let's call it, to simplify it, a SIM card that you would place into your satellite. You go into low earth orbit. Um, we have then an infrastructure in low earth orbit, essentially Kepler satellites that are all interconnected one to the other, um, acting as kind of cell towers, but in space. Um, and you would simply just connect to the network, just like your cell phone would connect to the cell towers here on Earth. Um, and at that point, you'd, you'd be able to do anything from, if you're familiar with um, SSHing into your satellite, you'd be capable of doing that in real time. Um, and the way we see it is that there's really kind of a need for both a low data rate kind of option and then it, and then also a high data rate option. So there'll be both uh, options, um, kind of depend on the technology that you can put on your spacecraft. It's fabulous. How, how do you see that evolving over time? 
Yeah, so um, today the the kind of the fundamental bottleneck that we're solving um, is that of uh, access to spacecrafts within low Earth orbit. So today when a satellite goes around the Earth, as you probably know, it's in low Earth orbit, it takes about 90 minutes, right? And within that 90 minute orbit, it needs to be able to communicate to a set of ground stations. And the issue is um, in order to have more access to your satellites, you need more ground stations, right? And even if you maximize the number of ground stations you can put on Earth, you're only going to be capable of communicating to your satellite in low Earth orbit 30% of the time. And that really comes from the fact that a huge portion of our Earth is uh, water. Uh, there's also mountains and there's regulatory challenges. So the first step is kind of how do we fill in the gap of 30%? If, if 30% is the, the amount of time that you maximum amount of time that you can communicate with your satellite and you have a ground station network in low Earth orbit, um, we want to make that go up to the 99 percentile, right? Um, how does Ether evolve over time? Um, Ether becomes kind of the internet infrastructure in space for not just Earth and low Earth orbit, but beyond that. So beyond that orbit, all the way to the moon or other sort of celestial bodies, if that makes sense. That's fabulous. And you're also able to use your network, as I understand it, to better deliver communications and information uh, let's say, among ships and, and transport right. vehicles as well here on Earth. Um, right. So, uh, I mean, I can talk about some of the applications of our Ether network. Um, one of the things that we really like to stress is, you know, as we develop this infrastructure in space, it's kind of allowing for other uh, companies to deliver on their missions as well, right? So an example would be if you have a, an Earth observation satellite, right? Your satellite, uh, its main mission is to take images of things like forest fires or, or any sort of disaster, be it like a tsunami. And your value proposition is to deliver that imaging to people on Earth so we can make decisions faster. So let's use the example of a forest fire. You take an image of a forest fire today and you have a very good photo of what that forest fire looks like the bottleneck comes down to bringing that photo back to Earth so that decisions can be made, made on the fly as to, you know, what do we do with respect to that forest fire? What we want to do with Ether is, is give that image in real time. You take an image of your satellite and instead of waiting for that image to come down through multiple different passes over ground stations, it's instantaneous. You get the image, you can make decisions on the ground. So that would be a type of application that, that you could you could sort of see within ether and obviously that expands to um, any sort of satellite that that produces data in space and needs to bring it back down to earth and um so how are you over or how are you overcoming that 30 percent limit are you relaying that information between satellites before it comes back down to ground stations or how does that work Right, yeah. Um, the other sort of term for what we're doing is called is data relay network. Um, it's essentially every satellite that we have in low Earth orbit is interconnected. And so if one customer is connected to one of our satellites, it's connected to all of our satellites. And so at all times, there's at least one Kepler satellite that will be on top of, you know, the 30 percent of the ground stations, thereby making it, you know, 99 percent available for customers. If they're connected to one, they're connected to all, and so they're always connected to a ground station. And, you know, as you mentioned, the differences and the changes brought about in space exploration by the rise of private enterprise and um, different organizations putting now you know, thousands of satellites into orbit. And uh, how, how does your system work with uh, having all these pieces up each trying to navigate navigate around around the orbits and dodging out of each other's way um well so our satellites will all be kind of well separated and everything and if your question is mostly related to you know as we see kind of this rise in in um satellite technology and the barrier to space becoming kind of more and more, uh, or lowering, sorry, the, the bar barrier to space. And so we're going to see more and more entities in space. Um, you know, what we believe when it comes to uh, collision avoidance and just risk mitigation in general is that actually our Ether network is going to help with that. Um, 
I think the the example I can come up with is it's like when planes used to fly without what's called ADSB, which is kind of how uh, the the control towers get to see where the the planes are, so you can mitigate risk and you can kind of map it all out. Um, the way we see it is that if you're carrying our you know SIM card as we like to call or as the analogy we've used, um, mm-hmm. then we can map out where you are in the orbit. Uh, and we can help with risk mitigation in orbit. So we really want to be uh, part of the solution towards uh, awareness, uh, space situational awareness, uh, and kind of help towards mitigating risk in space. And we do believe that our Ether network is going to help with with that specifically. Yeah. And I, um, you know, I personally just love the connections between oceans and space. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, as ships are out exploring, uh, exploring the oceans, exploring the you know, ocean floors and the sea life. And you're also going to be able to uh, assist them with data, correct, with managing those operations and expanding right. science. So today we have a, we actually have that capability today, uh, right? So Kepler has 19 satellites in space. Um we are capable of essentially doing what's called a store and forward or delivering a store and forward type service um, that we called global data service. Uh, essentially, it's kind of like a USB stick in space. So to your point, uh, some of our customers have been, you know, uh, polar research vessels that go up in the, the North Pole and, and they kind of put themselves in the ice and, and see how it moves over the year. Um, and they want to send all the, the data that they're generating, they want to send it back to the lab for processing. And today the solution would be either wait until the mission is done and then process it after the mission, um, or it would be sending over helicopters to pick up physical hard drives to bring it back and then make the kind of do the research back on Earth um, or back, sorry, on the uh, in the lab. So what we provide is kind of a store and forward service where if you're on the vessel, you can put all this data on our satellites and we can move it to another location um, for the, those kind of missions, yeah. And finally, what's what's next for Kepler Communications? What should people be on the look on be on the lookout for from you folks? Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, I think Kepler right now is really focusing on delivering on Ether as a service. Um, so you can look out for uh, an internet in space service that will be coming up online in the next couple of years. And um, between now and then, Kepler is going to be building out that infrastructure. Uh, and making announcements along the way on, you know, potential partnership deals with other companies uh, or simply helping other companies reach their mission through our infrastructure in space. Fabulous. Thanks for being on the show, Paul. It was great talking with you. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. And that was Paul Albert LeBron, Product Manager at Kepler Communications. Since 2000, the International Space Station, or ISS, has supported rotating crews remaining occupied uh, for well over two decades. The only group to have, so far, placed humans on the moon, NASA, now readies to place human beings once again on the face of the moon in the coming years. The space agencies of China and Russia are discussing plans for sending settlers to the moon, living inside the International Lunar Research Station. SpaceX has highly ambitious plans to land up to a million explorers on the ruddy surface of Mars in the coming decades. This project could cost as much as $10 trillion, according to SpaceX CEO Elon Musk. Over the next couple of decades, we are likely to see viable human settlements established on the Moon and Mars. Once these encampments are able to support their populations without supplies from Earth, the human race will become truly interplanetary. 
No longer will the existence of the human race be held hostage by the threat of nuclear war, planetary plague, or catastrophic impact from space. For the first time ever, our species may be able to survive any global disaster. The residents of these outposts will almost certainly live in international communities. The very challenge of space, survival at its harshest, will require people from all backgrounds and nationalities to work together. The very idea of nations could soon fall by the wayside. Another great paradigm shift of the next step in human evolution, space exploration. Join us again next week on the 8th of February for Just, Just Look, Look, Up, Look Up! Comets and the Earth. We welcome Pedro Bernardinelli, co-discoverer of possibly the largest comet ever seen, back to the show. We're going to talk about Don't Look Up and what it is actually like to discover one of the largest comets ever discovered. So make sure to join us then. Please subscribe, follow, and share the show. Visit us at thecosmiccompanion.net.com or .tv. Or, you know, really just look around social media, use the googly thing. You're an adult now. There's no one stopping you. I'm not your real dad. Just wishing everyone out there clear skies.